right, First Timothy chapter number three. I'm going to begin reading in uh, verse number 14. I'm going to just read uh, 14, 15, and 16. It is not where we'll be for the main part of our lesson this evening. But 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 14, These things write I, un I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Of course, this is uh, what we call one of the pastoral epistles. So First and Second Timothy and Titus are the pastoral epistles. Uh, Timothy, uh, we know a lot about Timothy. Uh, he was one, he was a young man to whom uh, Paul and Silas uh, were able to meet on their trip to, uh, they, were to they wanted to go into Asia, but uh, the Holy Spirit didn't allow them to go into Asia. And uh, they ended up going into uh, Macedonia. And uh, it was uh, with uh, Timothy there just starting off, working with Paul and Silas, that, that uh, Paul got the Macedonian call. And he got that vision that God gave to him, and the man saying, come over to us uh, and teach us and help us. And uh, so we know a bit about T Timothy and Timothy, uh, walked with uh, Paul and Silas, but then uh, others as well, uh, to whom uh, God used to train this young man and to teach this young man. And uh, Titus was another one of those young men. I don't know right offhand all of the uh, story behind his coming into uh, the ministry. I, Apostle Paul talks to Timothy about being my own son in the faith. And so we assume that the Apostle Paul led Timothy to the Lord. Uh, maybe that uh, period of time when he was there and uh, uh, prior to Timothy going off into uh, service with him. Uh, we don't know that, uh, but we don't know as much about Titus, but Timothy we know quite a bit quite a bit about and how God used him, used him in the ministry. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy and he's telling Timothy, uh, here's how things are supposed to go. Uh, how, here's how things are supposed to uh, operate. And so Paul is instructing Timothy on the off office and the operation of the office of the pastor, is that which Timothy uh, was holding and would be holding. And in this portion of Paul's letter, Paul said that the reason that he was writing to Timothy and not teaching him in person, he said that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. He said, it's important, I need to talk to you, how things are supposed to operate. He said, uh, uh, things are supposed to be done a certain way, and so Timothy, I want you to know how things are supposed to operate in the house of God how you're supposed to behave yourself, what it is you're supposed to do. Why? Because Paul wanted Timothy to be successful in what it was. Well, what was Paul writing about at that portion of time when he said that? Well, he was talking about the office of the bishop or the elder, and then also, secondly, the office of the deacon. And there Paul gave to Timothy the quali qualifications for both of those offices. And so God had set up an order for all things to be done, in the church of Jesus Christ. He said, this is the way that it's supposed to be done. These are the qualifications. This is who you're supposed to look for. This is who you're supposed to cho choose to set into these offices, and these are how these offices are supposed to op operate. So over the last number of Sunday evenings, we've been looking at keeping a church healthy. Uh, and not that the, the, the Beacon Baptist Church is unhealthy. Uh, it's not that I know of, uh, but we don't want it to be unhealthy. And so we want to look at the things that Paul talked about uh, to the church at Corinth, uh, and he talked to the church about how to keep things healthy. And so I started in this passage of Scripture because the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, there's an order in which supposed, things are supposed to be done. There's a way that stuff is supposed to take place, and there's a way that you're to behave yourself uh, in the house of God. And so that's much of what Paul was writing to Timothy about. So tonight, I want to briefly look at these, these two words, and I mean very briefly, these two words, we're going to see them five times uh, in First and Second uh, Corinthians. Uh, two times, uh, five times we're going to see it. Those two books, and the words are all things, and uh, or referring to all things in the church, and they, those things are what are necessary to help keep the church healthy. So let's pray, and we'll get started this evening. Our gracious heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we come before you this evening, Father God. We thank you so much, uh, Father, for the church that you have given here in Welland, Ontario. 
Father, what you've done here over the last uh, almost now coming on 15 years, Lord, what you've done and you continue to do uh, through these, your dear folks. And Father God, you've got a great church here. You've got a great foundation here. Uh, it's going in a great direction, a great love for you, a soul winning church. It's a fantastic place. And Father, uh, it would be your desire and then therefore our desire as well for this church to stay healthy. And so, Father, as we come to the word this evening, very briefly this evening, I hope and pray with all of my heart that you'll show us a couple things, nothing new that we haven't seen before, but you'll remind us again of what it is that we need to do, that we might keep things here healthy uh, at your church, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So these five things that I'm going to give to you uh, are to be done, which Paul talked to the church about, and there are five things that are going to help us in all things and the way they're to be done in the church. First of all is 1 Corinthians 10. And... Everything, first of all, is to be done to the glory of God. Everything is to be done for the glory of God. Look at verse number 23. First Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 23. Number five, five things I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Okay, so the word expedient is, uh, it's not good for me, right? Uh, uh, why, why are all things lawful? Do you have an idea? Why are all things lawful? Uh, we, we're no longer under the law. You're right. We're under grace. Right? So when Christ freed us, he freed us from the law. So we're not under that any longer. I'm not under the law anymore. That's right. I'm in my spiritual life now. And in my spiritual life, I am under grace. I'm not under the law. So all things are lawful for me. But he said there, now wait a minute. He said, wait a minute. But all things are not expedient. Right? So all things are not good for me. Now I can, there's a lot of things that I can go out and do because I'm not under the law anymore. But Paul said, be careful because they may not be good for you. Right? He said all things uh, are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Or the word to edify means to, to build up. So he said there, they, it may be lawful for you to do that, but it may not edify. It may not build up. In fact, if it's not good, it may tear down or it could keep you in that same plane where you don't want to be, right? Because we talked about the growth. One of the things that was necessary was growth in the Christian life. So let's go on because he's going to he's going to kind of elaborate a little bit on this. But we're going to kind of have to draw some stuff out of this to see what it is he's talking about here. Verse 24, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Now, that seems a little bit odd for him to put that in there, but he's going to kind of explain this. You'll understand that statement a little bit more as we read on. Verse 25, for whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So why do you not uh, uh, ask any questions for conscience sake? Why? Because you're not under the law. So it's talking about eating things. Okay, so where did this come from? Is it clean? Is it unclean? Is it lawful? Or is it unlawful? He said, you're not under the law anymore. So he's saying there, but he, he qualified it to start with. Verse, he said, let no man, right, seek his own, but every man another's man's wealth. He's going to come back. It's going to be important to us in just a moment. He said, whatsoever are therefore sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So it's lawful. But he said here, now wait a minute. We've got to be careful because we've got to be careful we're not seeking our own. We must be looking at how what we do affects other people. All right? It may not be expedient, may not be good, and it may not edify it may be okay for me, but it may not edify somebody else. It may tear somebody else down. All right, verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now an illustration. For, verse 27, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go. Say, hmm, okay, sure, I'll go. Here's an invitation. Why don't you come over to the feast and enjoy a feast with us? Okay, sure. Sounds good. I like to eat. Let's go. All right. So, and you be disposed to go whatsoever is set before you, what did he say there? He it. It's okay. Asking no question for conscience sake. Oh, well, that sounds good. Well, no, but wait a minute. He's not done with the principle here, right? So verse number uh, 28, he said, But if any man say unto you, This is offered and sacrificed unto idols. Okay, now we got a problem. He said, Now at that point, eat not for his sake that showed it. Not for yours, right? And he said, And for conscience sake. For the earth is the, uh, the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, verse 29, I say, not thine own, but of the other. You see it now? For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? He said, wait a minute. 
his conscience says, hey, here it is. This was served to idols. It was offered to idols. And here I'm serving to you. Are you going to eat it? You're, you're, you're a Christian. What are you going to do with it? Well, for me, I, you know, hey, bring it on. Uh, I'm hungry. It's food. I'm not going to ask any questions for conscience sake. I'm not going to, okay, hey, was this offered unto idols before I partake? All right, great. Bring it on. I'll take it. You don't want that one? Sure, bring it on my plate. I'll take that one as well, right? <laughs> That's me. I didn't get this way by not knowing how to do it. All right? It's, this is my hedge against inflation. So, but if somebody comes along and says, hey, there are you. That's a mighty nice looking pork chop you got there on your plate. Did you know Did you know that that pork chop was offered to idols? How are you going to handle it? Well, he said, that man's conscience is saying there's something wrong with that. Right? But he said, for you, it's lawful for you. But what's the problem? Though it's lawful, it may not be expedient. Though it's lawful, it may not edify. It may tear somebody else down. So he asks the question, for why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Look at verse number 30. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? It's lawful for me. So why is it that they're speaking evil of me? Hey, look at that guy. He ate that pork chop. Boy, it was a tasty pork chop, but it was offered unto I. Boy, I tell you, he, he says he's a Christian, right? So Paul asks two very important questions, and he gives the answer in verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do. It doesn't make any difference what it is. Is it lawful? All things are lawful. He said, do all how? Is God going to be glorified at that point in time when that man says that that was offered unto idols? How are you going to handle it? I want God to be glorified in this. I, I know I have liberty. I know that I can eat that pork chop. But that guy is putting this into my face because he wants to speak evil. But you know what? I want God to be glorified in this and say, and I'll say no thank you then. I, I, I would not take that then if that was sacrificed in the, in, in the idols. Everything is to be done. This is the principle that, that, that Paul is giving to the church. He's saying, you know, we have this idea today and we hear it all the time where people say, I have this liberty and so my liberty allows me to go out and do anything that I want to do. I can do it any way I want to do it and I can do whatever I want to do. But Paul said that's not true. And there's a, there is a principle that goes along with that. And the principle that he's giving here is everything is to be done to the glory of God. Everything in the church is to be done to the glory of God. Everything in my life is to be done to the glory of God. If it's not to God's glory, then we ought not be doing it. Oh, it may be okay. It may be all right. But if God is not going to be glorified, if somebody's going to be able to take it and use it against the work of God in my life or in my church or in the life of somebody else, then I'm going to look at that and say, okay, it's not because of my conscience, it's because of their conscience, but I want God to be glorified. So because I want God to be glorified, I'm going to submit my liberty and I'm not going to do it because it's not expedient. It's not good. In this situation, it's not good for me. I can go home, I can have in my, in my home, I'm, I can put my pork chop on my grill, I'll have my pork chop, and I don't need to worry about it because it's okay for me. But in this case, it's not good for me to have it. It's not going to edify, it's going to be a problem. So there, in the church, that's the first thing, he said all things, everything, no matter what it is, you can, you can go in, through anything and say, I wonder if God would have for us to do this. I wonder if we could do that. Will God be glorified? I, I think I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Will God be glorified? Is God going to be glorified or is it going to cause there to be maybe a little bit of a question on the cause of Christ, on the church, on your Christian walk? Is it, then you know what? Everything is to be done so that God will be glorified. The second thing, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 26. So the second thing is let all things be done unto edifying. So first thing is all things to be done to the glory of God. Second thing, let all things be done unto edifying. So 1 Corinthians 14, 26, how is it then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. What did he say? He said, let all things be done how? And edifying. The word edifying means to build up. 
So one person wants things done this way, another wants things done their way, and yet another wants things done the way they think they should be done. All of these people want what they want to please themselves and their thinking. But Paul writes that all things are to be done unto edifying. So my underlying question for that is, again, is it going to edify? Am I going to cause division? Am I going to cause problem? Am I going to cause trouble? Or is what I, is it going to build up? Because everything in the church, I uh, was uh, uh, talking the other day, and I was talking about uh, uh, training. And uh, the Bible says, train up a child the way you should go. And so I said, everything is to be for training, right, as a parent. But when we look at the church, it's the kind of the same thing, but it's everything is to be done to edification. Which edification is kind of like the training of a child, right? But in the church, everything is to be done. Everything we do, uh, a board of deacons, board of trustees. When you sit in your meetings and you talk about things that are being done, uh, uh, it's not, uh, can we have the, the biggest church? Can we, not, can we have the most beautiful church? Can we have the, the, the best? Is, is what we're doing, is it edifying? Because everything is to be done to edifying. Can we, can we, should we do this because it's going to help to build the church? Right? We'd like to, we would like to have a, a, a different building. It's not that we need a different building. We'd like to have a different building just simply because we'd like to have parking, right? So then the question has to be, okay, why do we want the other building? Do you understand where I'm going with this? I'm not trying to shoot down a new building or I'm not trying to push up a new building here. But what I'm just trying to show what Paul is saying here to the church is he said, everything has to be done in the edifice. Do we want that because we want to, to build we want to build each, we want to have a place to come. Uh, we want to have a place where, where, where visitors are able to come, they're able to find a place to park. The, 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 the seniors are able to come and they're able to, to, to pull up and to, to have a closed parking spot and we don't have to try and find a spot. Or, or Is that the way we want it or do we want it? It's everything is to be done in the edifying. Everything, everything, that's the underlying. All things are to be done in the edifying. Are we building people up by this? See, we got this. We got this idea, or maybe we just as pastors have this idea that everything in the church is. To, we have this idea to build the church. We have whole conferences on building the church, right? And we have this idea of building the church. And I do a lot of times is, you know, uh, uh, you look at the, the big churches, and they're the ones that have the big steeples and they have the big auditoriums, and and they're building the new buildings and they're building the big buildings. And, oh, I like to have that myself, right? Have that nice new, new, new but, but why are we doing what we're doing? That's not building the church. The church is people, right? So is that new building, is it building people? Are we building lives? Are we building each other's lives? Are we edifying one another? Are we, we encouraging one another in the faith? And that's what it's all about, folks. They're, they're, that's why we're here. You know, the church is not the most important thing. The most important thing is to know for sure you're on your way to heaven, right? The most important thing in your life is your salvation. Then after that, then comes church. Church is not a priority prior to. Church is, it should be a priority afterwards, right? Because it's a place that God has for us to come, and we're supposed to be encouraged, and we're supposed to be uplifted. That's part of that edification process, right? That's what's supposed to be taking place. So he said, let all things be done unto edifying. Third, let all things be done decently and in order. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 14, 40. It says right there, let all things be done decently and in order. I, I, I didn't sit in my office and have to come up three hours with the heading for that one. Decently means honestly. Orderly means regular arrangement. That is, in time or fixed succession of rank or character. Character. There's the order to how things go, and it's done honestly. Everything. Everything. Absolutely everything is to be done decently, honestly, and with order. An order there is to everything. The fourth thing is let all things be done with charity. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. 
Let all your things be done with charity. So Paul here is in his closing instructions to the first letter that he wrote, or first recorded letter that he wrote, or inspired letter. And he slips this in in the very closing remarks of this book, this letter. So when we're speaking about someone else in the church uh, negatively, are we doing it in love? Because everything is to be done by, with charity, right? Uh, uh, whatever we're doing, are we, are we doing it because of love? Why are we doing it? Should be, that should be a question. Why do we do what we do? Do we do it out of love? Well, I put this in my notes. If it were done in love, then it would be done God's way, wouldn't it? So it wouldn't be done Jeff's way, or Bill's way, or Bob's way, or Emilio's way. It would be done God's way if we were doing it in love, right? Fifth and lastly, Go to 2 Corinthians, chapter number 6. And it's really quite similar to the very first one that we talked about there. But he, he kind of says it a little bit of a different way. He says, in all things, approving ourselves as a minister of Christ. So look at verse number 1, 2 Corinthians, chapter number 6, verse number 1. He said, we then as workers together with him. Who are we working together with? Who's the him? Beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain, or emptiness, or, 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 or just, it's worthless. Right? There's, there's, there's got to be, there's got to be some benefit to that, right? For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, the day of salvation, I have succored thee, or helped thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time, behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. So who's not to be, what is not to be blamed? I've got to be careful what I'm doing, right? Why? So the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, look at this verse, but in all things of approving, or that word approving actually means to exhibit ourselves as what? In patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses and stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and watchings and fastings by pureness, by knowledge, by longsuit, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love and fame. The word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand, on the left hand, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown, yet well known, as dying. Behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. So in all that, all that what did he say? We are to exhibit ourselves as the ministers of God. Our life is to be an example. It's to, to show to everyone everything, everything we do. Do, do, we, do we example? Um, you know, this is kind of a lame example, but I'll give you a bit of an example. You know, last Sunday morning, you know, all the parking spots out here were taken. You know, your first inclination is you want to march over to the neighbor's house. Move your vehicle out of the way. Park right in front of our church. Don't you know this is the house of God? Heathen, move your vehicle out of the way. Right? But what do we have to do? We have to be careful, right? Because we are to, to be approved to exhibit ourselves as the ministers of Christ. We're, we're his ambassadors. So what we say and what we do is an example to them or should be an example to them of what Christ is, what Christ wants to, to do through us. But if we go over there and we, you know, pound on the door and, and we, you know, you know, pull the bus around and put her in low and <clears throat> push the cars up the sidewalk. There we go. We got, don't think I didn't think about it. But what am I, what am I supposed to do? I'm, I'm supposed to, to exhibit myself as a, doesn't matter what it is. It all, you people love you. The people don't love you. They're kind to you. They're not kind to you. You suffer. You don't suffer. We went through all these things. It doesn't make any difference. Everything in the church, everything we go through, we want to keep our church healthy. We have to exhibit ourselves as the ministers of God, ambassadors for Jesus Christ. How does the world see us as ministers of Christ? I think they do. I think they see your church that way. I hear that. I hear it when people come in. They, they say all the time, boy, the church has got a sweet spirit. Uh, it's got a great spirit there in the church. God's doing, boy, God's doing great things. I think 
the last uh, three pastors that have come and, and uh, preached for you folks, uh, all three of them at some point in time were in tears, in tears of joy, saying, wow, what a wonderful work that God is doing here. Yeah. I think it was Brother Teeson who said, you know, uh, boy, people ought to know about this is here. Other churches, they would be encouraged if they could see what the Lord is doing here in this place. Right? And that, that's what God wants from me. He wants us that, to be that. This Isn't that what Christ wants for it to be? But we got to keep that up, right? We can't let that be torn down. So he said, we have a healthy church. We don't want it to be unhealthy. And so therefore, in all things, in everything, approving ourselves as the ministers, exhibiting ourselves as the ministers of God. See, these five things are to be a part of all things done in the church. If the church is going to stay healthy. If it's going to stay, and if it's going to be unhealthy, probability is that one of these things we're just not making attendance to, right? Or maybe we're, we're not we're overlooking one of those areas, right? Uh, when 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 strife starts and things start to get a little bit unhealthy, what usually we're not loving like we should love, right? Or, or, or we're not, we're not, uh, we're not uh, submitting uh, our will and our liberty to, to another man's conscience, right? I don't, you don't have to look forlorn. I mean, I'm right there with you, folks. I'm just, I'm in the same, I'm in the same seat that you're in. Uh, I'm not saying we're doing that because we've got a healthy church, but I'm saying we got to be careful, right? Because we don't want that. Uh, we want this church to stay healthy, stay what it is, because it's reaching a lot of people. It really is. There's a lot of folks that are coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And uh, it's a soul winning church. And, and you know what? It's going to get known as that uh, before long. It'll be, it'll be known, hey, if you if you want your loved one, go over there to Beacon, right? Because those people will certainly tell and they'll help you. And they'll help you with it. And that's what you want. That's the love of Christ, isn't it? And uh, that's what we want that to be. So those five things, five things I just wanted to share with you this evening uh, from the letters of Paul to Corinth uh, on keeping uh, our church healthy. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for your church. Thank you for what you've done here, what you're doing here, what you will do here. We thank you for the time you've given us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. We still have a few minutes left this evening, and before we uh, conclude tonight, I just wanted to give a bit of a, there's two things that I would like to do tonight. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, if you'd like to take just a moment and give a testimony of something that the Lord is doing in your life right now, give you the opportunity for that. Uh, before we get to that, though,